And that brings us to Iran, which really doesn't have any good options, I think, right now. It can do nothing between now and January and make sure that it's not making it more complicated for Biden to return to the deal. But then it risks appearing weak domestically and internationally. That's the voice of Dr. Ariane Tabatabai, Middle East Fellow at the German Marshall Fund. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. I realize that we're only three weeks away from the end of the year, but 2020 seems to not be slowing down. Michelle, I know just what you mean. I can't wait to put 2020 in the rearview mirror. Uh, And I am really hopeful about 2021. But before we get there, uh, 2020 is still creating challenges. And we'll talk about one of those on early warning, where we talk about an important but underappreciated story, the recent U.S. missile defense test that for the first time shot down a long-range ballistic missile target from a ship. Uh, This could be a major roadblock for future arms reduction talks with China and Russia. And please tune in and we'll explain why. And after that, I sit down with Middle East expert Dr. Ariane Tabatabai to talk about the other major news story these past couple of weeks. She tells us about the what the assassination of one of Iran's top nuclear scientists means for both regional stability and the incoming Biden administration's plans to rejoin the JCPOA. Lastly, our own Mary Kaczynski answers a question about the link between Iran proxy groups and U.S. compliance with the Iran nuclear deal on this week's Q&A segment. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, tweet or DM us at Press Button Pod or send us an email at pressthebutton at plowshares.org. We would love to hear from you. And I know we ask you every week, but we really do mean it. If you like what you hear, click the subscribe button and give us a rating. But let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thank you, Dell. In October, as reported on this show, North Korea unveiled a new long-range ballistic missile at a military parade. And as if on cue last month for the first time, a U.S. ship-based interceptor destroyed a long-range ballistic missile target in a test. And many are concluding, wrongly, I think, that this proves that the United States can intercept ICBMs such as North Korea's from sea. And here to help us understand this better is Laura Grego, who is a senior scientist in the Global Security Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. And Laura is focused on missile defense issues and has a PhD in experimental physics. Laura, welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, Thanks for the invitation, Tom. So Laura, please tell us, let's start with the basics. What happened in this test? Yeah, so early in the morning before I got up even, um, on November 17th, the Missile Defense Agency staged a test, as you said, that that pitted the Aegis missile, missile defense system against an intercontinental ballistic missile range target. That target missile was launched east from the Kwajalein Atoll towards the Navy's Aegis ship waiting between Hawaii and California. And by the Pentagon's account, the test was successful, meaning that the missile was intercepted. You might ask, why did it happen? We have a missile defense system that's designed to protect, or it's meant to protect the U.S. from long-range missiles. It's called the ground-based mid-course defense. Um, And the Aegis missile defense system is a regional defense. So that one, this this ship-based one, is intended to provide you know, ships with the capability to intercept short and intermediate range ballistic missiles. So on a regional basis, so they can, they're sort of designed to protect smaller areas sort of measured in hundreds of kilometers, which are, you know, definitely too small to provide practicable defense of the U.S. 
Um, but that system is getting an upgraded interceptor. It's called the SM3 Block 2A, and those will be, they'll have faster speeds and they'll, they're cap- the kill vehicles will be more capable. And so the idea was maybe it would make them theoretically possible of engaging strategic missiles. Congress mandated a test to find out if this was the case. Um, so they called for a test to provide sort of proof of concept, and uh, they mandated it happened before the end of 2020, and they got it in, uh, in November. And yeah. so what does all this mean? What do you make of all this um, beyond the technical issue? Yeah. Particularly, what does it mean for relationships with Russia and China, for example? Yeah. So for one, it was underwhelming from a technical perspective. Like It was very orchestrated. It wasn't challenging. Like all homeland tests, the conditions were totally unlike reality. So it doesn't show that you can have a real defense against even North Korean threats. So Russia and China know all that, that they are fully cognizant of the technical limitations of those systems. But the Aegis system is poised to grow in capacity greatly over the coming decades. And the plans on the books call for deploying hundreds of these new, more capable interceptors. And they'll be on scores of mobile ships. So you can imagine um, if if you station these ships off the the coast of the U.S. or maybe built one you know, one Aegis Ashore station that you might be able to provide, in theory, defense of the whole United States against long-range missiles. And so then you'd have hundreds of these strategically capable interceptors. And that presents specifically to China, I mean, in particular to China, a challenge because that then the number of interceptors will be on par with their expected survivable missiles after a first strike. Um, you know, they have less than 50 mobile uh ground-based ICBMs. And so the GMD current system is sort of a much smaller scale, but when you add in these hundreds of missiles, then they they can't not respond. And so, uh, Laura, how would you expect Russia and China to respond to this? Well, um, it provides, you know, either encouragement or justification for them to... um, certainly diversify and grow their own nuclear arsenals because of this, you know, desire to stay ahead of U.S. defenses. So that's not helpful. Uh, Russia has made very clear that that's why they, uh, they're they building these new sophisticated other delivery systems, such as nuclear powered cruise missile, et cetera. So that's, that's not helpful. But I think um, in, the, in the near term, also, it makes Um, the next round of arms control much more challenging because um, you can't ignore the size of the U.S. strategic, the the potential size of U.S. missile defenses against strategic missiles. And so I think there's just going to have to be a reckoning. There's going to have to be a a real conversation um, about the next round of arms control, which I certainly hope happens. Assuming the Biden administration, incoming Biden administration, wants to pursue um, arms control with Russia and China, uh, what would you suggest that they do in this situation? Yeah, so I think one of the first things they need to do is make clear again that the missile defense system is solely for a limited threat and not aimed at Russia and China. That's been policy for a long time, but the Trump administration tried to blur that line. Um, and second, I think they need to look for ways to demonstrate that that's true. Don't don't test the Aegis system against an ICBM again and consider limits on basing, um, number, um, uh, on its missile defense in order to demonstrate that's true. And ideally, those limits can be incorporated into the next round of arms control discussions, which we hope happens under this administration. And, and that that the U.S. being willing to talk about missile defense could uh, sort of unlock the next round of nuclear reductions. I think without talking about missile defense, we'd, we'd get nowhere. Laura, uh, thank you. There is the siren. We are out of time. Uh, But this has been a great conversation, and I'm sure we'll keep talking about these issues uh, in the year ahead. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Today, I am thrilled to have Dr. Ariane Tabatabai, Middle East Fellow at the German Marshall Fund. She has a new book out, No Conquest, No Defeat, Iran's National Security Strategy. And today, she's here to help us understand the significance of the assassination of one of Iran's top nuclear scientists. Ariane, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure to have you. Although I feel like we always invite you back for just the most depressing reasons. (laughs) But let's get down to business. I mean, so two weeks ago, um, 
Mozen Fakhrizadeh, who played an important leadership role in designing Iran's nuclear program, was assassinated in Iran in a really just dramatic and spectacular fashion. Uh, what does this mean? I mean, we are at a really crucial point in relations right now. Yeah, so let's take a step back and talk a little bit about who he was so that we can put it in context. Um, this is someone who was uh, one of the key architects of Iran's previous nuclear weapons program. Uh, you'll, your listeners will know this, but that's the program that ended in 2003, uh, according to the IAEA and to the U.S. intelligence community, and uh, some elements of which continued into 2009. Uh, but this is the, the sort of consolidated weapons part of Iran's uh, nuclear program. And Fahri Zadeh, I think, was um, sort of a project manager of sorts. He was there to really help uh, create the infrastructure, the team to run this program. And later on, it seems like he was tasked with trying to maintain that know-how so that if and when Iran decided to weaponize, uh, it would be able to do so uh, and not have as steep a learning curve. So uh, this is someone who was very close to the highest levels of the regime. Uh, needless to say, if you were put in charge of one of the key um, security projects that the, the country has undertaken in the past 40 years since their evolution, you are probably someone who's deeply loyal, who is very trusted by uh, the most uh, high level uh, decision makers, including the supreme leader. Uh, and I think another piece that is uh, pretty interesting to know about him is that uh, he was actually a member of the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. Uh, it's not something that is widely known about him uh, because we don't know a ton about his uh, the military part of his career. Uh, but like many decision makers in Iran today, his career starts with the Iran Iraq War, and uh, he was deployed to those uh, fronts. And so you know he's again someone who was very much involved in deep in a deep deep way in core parts of Iran security architecture. Uh, so why am I saying all this? Uh, because, you know, I think this is a very significant target um, that was hit in Iran and it happened right outside of Tehran in the countryside. He was uh, reportedly uh, traveling with his wife, with some uh, security people, and he was going to visit his in-laws. And that this happened on Iranian soil outside of Tehran to such a high level target who had been identified by Prime Minister Netanyahu and a presser uh, a few years ago. Uh, just tells you how uh, traumatic the, the, this is for Iran and for the Iranian leadership, who has yet another significant internal security and security fail in general this year, uh, recalling that this year started with, uh, we talked about this uh, about a year ago, the killing of Qasem Soleimani, a top IRGC commander in Iran. And of course, in between, we've had the explosions at Natanz and elsewhere. So there's a lot that has happened. It's not been a good year for Iran, needless to say, uh, not for the regime and certainly not for the people either. And, and so, you know, this is, again, highlighting uh, deep vulnerabilities, it seems, in the Iranian system. Now, in terms of the implications for Iran's nuclear program, uh, which I think are, are particularly relevant for our purposes, uh, there is no evidence that this is going to change the way Iran is running its nuclear program or the decision making uh, right now. This is not someone who seemed to be particularly involved in the enrichment side of things or the research and development that Iran is doing currently. Uh, and you know, I think the other piece that is also important to put in context is that, again, this is someone who was very, very important. But but who was one of a larger team of a larger organization bureaucracy uh, that was running uh, the, the Iranian nuclear program. So he was not by any means the only one who had the key to the uh, to potentially weaponizing the, the program. So what's been the fallout? I mean, given the significance of this, how has Iran responded so far? Uh, well, uh, it's um, we don't really know the full extent of it. Iran has promised to retaliate uh, so far, of course, um, and there's been a, a lot of debate within Iran, which we can come back to uh, in terms of what to do, what not to do. Uh, but at least the, the the first thing that I think is is uh, important to to highlight here is that there was a bill uh, that was uh, passed by the Iranian parliament and approved by the Guardian Council, uh, so passed into law this week. 
uh, this past week. And um, this is important because there's been a lot of misinformation around it, I think. And, and I think it's important to sort of contextualize it. The first thing I've seen a lot in the reporting is that this is one of the reactions to the killing of Fafri Zadeh. It's perhaps a, a, a way to retaliate uh, for the killing of Fafri Zadeh. And that doesn't seem to be the case. I think there was an element of that uh, event sort of fast tracking the bill through the parliament and the, the Guardian Council. This is typically a, a, a sort of a deliberation process that takes many, many weeks or in months. And uh, so it seems like it was fast tracked, but the bill actually predates the whole Fafri Zadeh's stuff, right? It actually started to be considered uh, weeks ago, if not months ago. Uh, so that's that's something to know. Um, there's been a second piece that has been sort of, um, I, I think uh, there's been a lot of confusion around it, which is what the bill actually does and doesn't do. To be clear, I think this is a pretty significant step. Uh, it is certainly uh, the Iranian parliament trying to reassert itself in this space and in a way that it hadn't done in a few years. Uh, I think since the JCPOA was passed, actually, they hadn't really been as active and assertive in the space. And uh, this is slightly different uh, from, from that. Uh, ultimately, it tries to put pressure on the government uh, to act fast and to, to pressure the United States to return to the deal uh, more quickly as well. Uh, some of the key elements include um, it, it sort of asks for Iran to resume enrichment at 20%, which of course would be a, a pretty uh, significant uh, escalatory step. It also asks Iran to uh, install more advanced centrifuges and to use them uh, for enrichment purposes, which is also not something Iran is supposed to be doing under the deal. Uh, and uh, it also asks for Iran to install a new reactor that is similar to the Iraq heavy water reactor, which your listeners will um, will know um, has been a, a source of tension between Iran and uh, the, the international community in the United States for a while. Um, and the most significant and I think piece here is actually about the monitoring and verification and the and Iran's cooperation with the IAEA. The bill says that if Iran doesn't receive uh, the banking and oil related relief that it wants, that within two months of its of the entry into force of the bill, Iran would start to dial back some of its compliance uh, with um, elements of uh, IAEA monitoring that go beyond its safeguards agreement. Now, I've seen in the media this as being reported as you know Iran is essentially kicking out all inspectors from Iran. That is not happening. Uh, what they've said is that they would not go beyond what is mandated by their saf safeguards agreement, which means the additional protocol wouldn't be implemented for example, and some of the additional things that are mandated by the JCPOA, like, you know, uh, monitoring of centrifuge workshops, those things would go. Uh, but of course, the IAEA would still be able to, uh, at least under the current version of the bill, would still be able to, uh, to monitor the facilities that it has access to under the safeguards agreements that Iran has with the IAEA. So, this leads us then to the next question. You know, this bill clearly is setting up Iran. I mean, you talk about this, right? Two months after entry into force. That is not right now. That is when there is a Biden administration. So and, and clearly this assassination happened at a point where, you know, you are in the last waning days of the Trump administration before there's a new leader in town. So how do you see these events, whether it's the bill, whether it's the assassination, changing the landscape for an incoming Biden administration? And what does it mean for a resumption of diplomacy? Well, you know, as you said, the transition period is is um, passing by quickly, but it's there's also a lot of time left for all these various players to do things, and a lot can happen between now and January 20th that will make life a lot more difficult for the incoming Biden administration, which has, uh, you know, uh, pre President-elect Biden having said um, on the campaign trail that he would like to return to the JCPOA and use it as the baseline to build on it. Now, um, 
Israel, on the one hand, which is um, believed to be behind this attack, which is believed to have had a role to play with uh, the explosion in Atanz a few months ago, and who has a very long track record of targeting various nuclear programs throughout the region in Syria and Iraq and Iran itself with, with Stuxnet and with the assassination of other Iranian um, nuclear scientists, uh, can do a lot still. Uh, it can uh, continue some of its op uh, covert operations. It can sabotage uh, parts of Iran's nuclear program. And, and there is, you know, we can speculate about why, why they would want to do this. There's theories that it might be to make it more difficult for uh, President-elect Biden to return to the deal once he is inaugurated. But there are also, I think, um, um, sort of you know, theories uh, that are that that make sense to me that they're just concerned about the trajectory of the Iranian nuclear program and they want to try to set it back uh, while they believe they have a green light from uh, the White House. Uh, so I, I don't want to get too much into the the sort of politics of, of that. It's also not in my expertise, but I think that we can. Uh, I don't think I don't know if we can expect it, uh, but there is certainly a possibility that we'll see more of these types of actions between now and January 20th from Israel. In the United States, what we do know is that President Trump is planning on rolling out new sanctions uh, on a weekly basis um, to make it more difficult for the incoming administration to return to the deal. There are a lot of debates about whether or not the sanctions actually do a lot. Um, you know, they may not make it that much more difficult, frankly, actually, for uh, Biden to return to the deal uh, in terms of the, the legal uh, piece of it. But uh, on the political side, it does it may make it a bit trickier. Uh, some have some have argued there are more that the the, uh, the Trump administration can, can also do. Um, President Trump, uh, you know, has reportedly considered striking Iranian nuclear facilities. I don't know that that would necessarily be his first choice, given that he has long promised to withdraw uh, troops from the region and end forever wars. Uh, but it is certainly something that he's toyed around with. And that brings us to Iran, which really doesn't have any good options, I think, right now. It can do nothing between now and January and make sure that it's not making it more complicated for Biden to return to the deal. But then it risks appearing weak domestically and internationally. And it risks, um, you know, having this sort of growing pressure domestically to act and to do something. Uh, if it does things, then uh, what are its options? It can sort of um, undertake cyber actions as it has done in the past against Israel. It can use proxies to target Israeli positions. Um, and, you know, there, uh, there are more overt options that it could also be using, but all of these also come with a cost, uh, meaning that it can further heighten tensions. Ultimately, if there are U.S. casualties, for example, I think that would really be the worst case scenario for Iran, uh, because it would be incredibly difficult for an incoming Biden administration to, uh, to return to the deal after having seen U.S. casualties. So the prospect of the United States getting dragged into this, th these tensions, whether it's in Iraq or in Iran itself, is, is uh, not an appealing uh, prospect for Iran. There's one group we haven't talked about in all of this. Well, there's many groups, but there's one that sticks out to me, and that's the Europeans. Is there anything that they should be doing right now, or is this a you have a front row seat to a really tense point in history? Well, yeah, I, I think the, the trouble is that the Europeans' um, role uh, is um, is not very prominent in all of this, right? They, what they can do is what they've been doing, which is try to get all parties to uh, to uh, chill a little bit and uh, <laughs> and um, make sure that tensions don't escalate uh, further. And they've tried to do that with some success in, in the past. But I think that actually what we've learned over the past couple of years is that the Europeans are not really in a position to do a whole lot without the United States on this piece. And that is not lost on the Iranians who, you know, even in the bill we've been talking about, the bill doesn't mention the United States directly. It keeps referring to the P4 plus one. So the remaining parties of the deal. But actually, it doesn't need or it doesn't it doesn't believe it can get that relief that it wants from the P4 plus one because they can't they can't do that with the, without the United States. So ultimately, 
although it doesn't even mention the U.S., the U.S. is really the main player it is focused on. And that is going to be the case for the foreseeable future. The sanctions relief that Iran needs has to come from the United States. And if you don't have an administration that is interested in providing that, the Europeans can make noise and they can, you know, uh, try to lobby the U.S. They can uh, play a moderator or facilitator with the uh, Israelis and the Iranians, but ultimately uh, they're, uh, they're there's going to be limits to what they can achieve. And I'm assuming a similar analysis applies then to the Russia. I mean, you, you brought up the rest of the members of the agreement to the Russians and Chinese as well. Yeah. And the Russians and the Chinese have this additional piece of, you know, they are much more sympathetic to the Iranian uh, way of thinking about all this, right? They they believe that the United States is the one that withdrew from, from the deal. So they may actually be more in line uh, or aligned with the Iranians than the Europeans are. The Europeans, I, I think, are sort of stuck a little bit because they, on the one hand, they see the Iranian point of view. On the other hand, they're also like the United States and uh, not very happy with a lot of the things that Iran has been doing. In, in the past. So uh, that that puts all of them in slightly different baskets, I guess. Um, but similarly, I think you're right that the Russians and the Chinese are also uh, fairly limited in what they can do. After all, Iran didn't come to the negotiating table for business with China and Russia, which it had prior to the deal anyway. It came to the table because it wanted to have that cooperation with the Europeans. Ariane, Thank you so much for joining us. And we will, I'm sure, have you back on before this transition period is over. Um, But before we go, uh, you have a new book out. And clearly, it's informed your analysis here today. If people want to know more, where can they get your book? Um, yeah, well, thanks again for, for having me. It's always really fun to be on. And uh, the book, well, you can get it if you're in uh, in the D.C. region at Politics and Prose. Otherwise, any of your local bookstores and if you must on Amazon. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. My name is Alyssa Kareem, and I'm the Development Associate at Plowshares Fund. I'm also a contributor to and a dedicated listener of the Press the Button podcast. I believe it is critical that millennials like myself learn and speak out about foreign policy issues. That's why in-depth and honest discussions about nuclear policy and national security, like the ones on this podcast, are so important. To help us continue our work at Plowshares Fund, and to keep the forward-moving conversations going each week with Press the Button, we rely upon the generosity of supporters and listeners like you. Whether you donate $5 or $50 to Plowshares Fund, your generosity is how we keep the world informed on the dangers of nuclear weapons. If you like what you're hearing on Press the Button and want to support the work of Plowshares Fund, please donate today. Visit plowshares.org to make a monthly or a one-time donation. Be a part of our vision of a world where nuclear weapons can never be used again. Thank you for listening. And now, everyone's favorite nuclear Q&A segment. This week's question comes from Justin from Wisconsin. Are you ready for this, Mary? Yes, Tom, let's do it. Justin asks, a major point of opposition to the Iran nuclear deal was the belief that if the Iranians were given sanctions relief, they would be in a better position to fund terrorism across the region. Between 2015 and 2018, when the United States was in compliance with the nuclear deal, was there in fact an increase in terrorism from Iranian proxy groups? How has their behavior changed since the United States withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal? That was a main point of attack against the Iran nuclear agreement when it was negotiated back in 2015. In fact, we've seen exactly the opposite when it comes to Iranian proxy attacks in the region. So here are the facts. Number one, there were no direct attacks by Iranian proxies against US forces in the region. 
while the U.S. and Iran were complying with the nuclear deal. I'm going to repeat that because it's a really important point. There were no proxy attacks by Iran during the time when the U.S. was complying with the nuclear deal. Against U.S. forces in the region, there were no direct attacks. After Trump pulled out, that's when these attacks started. Missile attacks against U.S. forces in Iraq, rocket attacks against the U.S. embassy in Baghdad. All of those attacks started after Trump pulled the U.S. out of the nuclear deal. Now, here's another fact. Point number two, some of the money that Iran got from sanctions relief, some of that probably went to the military. However, and this is a direct quote from Lieutenant General Vince Stewart when he was testifying before the Senate Armed Service Committee in 2017. He was asked about this question of sanctions relief and what it went towards. He said, some of the money that Iran has gained went to the military, but the preponderance of the money has gone to economic development and infrastructure. Iran prioritizes economic development and infrastructure, and that's where the money from nuclear sanctions relief went. The last and really important point, point number three, is that Iran sanctions, the sanctions that the Trump administration has imposed on Iran, that benefits Iranian hardliners. Iranian hardliners have a stranglehold on the Iran economy and the, the smuggling network, the black market. So when the U.S. imposed these really harsh sanctions, Iranian hardliners got richer and the Iranian people got poorer. Those sanctions really hurt the Iranian people. So when you lift those sanctions, sanctions relief benefits the Iranian people and it it lessens the ability of those hardliners to, to control the economy and to control the black market. So the bottom line here is that Iran did get some sanctions relief from the nuclear deal in exchange for the concessions that they made regarding their nuclear program. But the vast majority of that sanctions relief has benefited the Iranian people. It has not gone to fund direct attacks against the U.S. in the region. Those attacks started after the U.S. pulled out of the nuclear deal. Another week, another question. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, Justin, for the question. And remember, if you would like your question to be on the air, tweet or DM us at, at pressbuttonpod or send us an email at pressthebutton at plowshares.org. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Sender, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.